What's up you guys? So in this one we're going to talk about a very interesting topic I would say that arises a lot in game theory which is the zero-sum game. So as I did in the previous lectures we're going to start off with a very small and easy example to see what's going on. That is we're going to formulate the zero-sum game using two players as you can see here. We're going to talk about the payoff matrix and the expected return or the expected payoff of the game followed by the convex optimization formulation of the game so how you could formulate an optimization problem that turns out to be convex on how to solve the zero-sum game that is the optimization problem should return the optimal strategies that each player should play in order to maximize their expected return or expected payoff Okay, we're going to see that not only that this problem is convex, but it is also a linear program for each player. So we're going to see that player one is solving a certain optimization problem, whereas player two is solving not only another optimization problem, but the dual of player one's optimization problem. So said informally, player one is optimizing a certain problem, whereas player two is optimizing the dual of player one's problem. This is it. We're going to see how MATLAB could be embedded over here to solve the problem. So it will return the optimal strategies for player one and player two. And we're going to play the game. We're going to run a simulation to track the scores of each player using their optimal strategies, of course. So as you can see over here, we're tracking the scores of player one versus player two. We're going to see that depending on the payoff matrix, the player who tends to win will differ. Of course, if I set the payoff matrix all positive, that means player one will gain all the time, no matter what moves player one or two make, player one is going to end up winning, right? So it clearly depends on the payoff matrix. Don't worry if you don't know what the payoff matrix is. We're going to explain it in just a while from now. So. Without further ado, let's get started. So as in the previous lectures, we're going to explain how a zero-sum game works using a simple example. So imagine the case where I've got two players, player one and player two. They're on a table and they're, let's say they're playing a certain game where the moves of player one and player two are in some way related. How are they related? through a matrix called the payoff matrix. So the payoff matrix could be represented as a table where if player one plays the move one and player two plays move three, then the payoff that player one should pay to player two or gain from player two is found in this entry, sitting at the first row and third column. So let's fill in some random values. So as you can see, if let's say player one moves move one and player two moves move three, then player one should gain 20 points. Okay. Now this matrix could be represented as such simply by copy pasting the values from the table to the matrix. Now this matrix is usually referred to as the payoff matrix for the game or associated to the game. Now, clearly the goal of player one is to maximize the expected payoff, whereas player two would be to minimize the expected payoff, right? Also, let's assume that this game uses a randomized or mixed strategies. That said, each player makes their own decision independently of the other player's choice. So since we're randomized here, we should introduce some certain probability distribution for each player. So for that, let's say that player one picks move one with probability u1 and move two with probability u2. So player one is characterized by a discrete distribution u where the probability that player one chooses move one is u1 and the probability that player one chooses move two is u2 likewise the probability that player two chooses move one is v1 move two is v2 and move three is v3 now it will turn out useful to stack all those probabilities in a certain vector well for v let's stack them in a vector called 
lowercase v. So v is a column vector containing the probabilities. Likewise, u is a vector containing u1 and u. All right, now let's not forget that those probabilities should add up to 1. This will show up in, a cons in the constraint of the optimization problem that we're going to introduce. So it will turn out useful to define an important metric that is the expected payoff from player one to player two, right? So those values are the values that player one gains, right? So player, we say that player one gains 30 points if player one moves move one and player two moves move one. Player one loses 10 points if player one moves one and player two moves two, okay? So it is really easy to define an expected payoff. Let's call it E. That is the weighted sum UI, VJ, PIJ. So we're, we're just weighing, we're just summing up the expected, we're just summing up terms to form a certain average, right? So let's say we focus on P12, the probability that player one plays move one is u1. So we multiply p12 by u1, and the probability that player two plays move two is v2. Note that those probabilities are, as we said, independent. So player one will choose a random move regardless of the moves that player two chooses, right? So for that, you could see that the probabilities are decoupled. Otherwise, we should have introduced the notion of conditional probability. That is, if player one will base his decision according to the move of player two, then we should have said v2 times p12 times p of one given two. But since they're independent, then the probability that you choose a certain move given an observed move of player two is just the probability that u chooses that move, regardless of what v chooses, right? So for that, you see that it's just a simple weighing of the probabilities with the associated payoff, right? So according to player one, player one will wish to maximize the expected payoff, while player two wishes to minimize it, okay? So player one is going to maximize a certain cost in u, right? There's a certain min-max situation going on here, right? So player one is trying to maximize the expected payoff while player two is trying to minimize it. Well, let's do something that is alternating here. Let's first look at the problem from player two's perspective, right? So player two, again, would like to minimize the expected payoff. The expected payoff could be expressed as an inner product you transpose P V, right? So that said, if we regard the expected payoff as a bilinear function of U and V, first let's look at the infimum of U transpose P V, the expected payoff, with respect to V, because that's what player two is trying to do. He's trying to minimize it. So we'll, we'll take the infimum of the expected payoff where V is entry-wise positive because it reports probabilities and the entries sum up to 1. So 1 transpose V is equal to 1, right? Now it turns out that solving this gives us an entry-wise minimum. So we're trying to minimize the entries of the term U transpose P, where I goes from 1 to M or we're trying to minimize P transpose U entry-wise. So each element of P transpose U should be minimized, okay? So we're trying to minimize the first entry of P transpose U, second entry down to its last entry, okay? So this is what player one wants to maximize. He wants to maximize the minimum of the entries of P transpose U. Subject to, again, since U reports probabilities, then each entry should be positive and the entries should sum up to one, right? Now we could have formulated another problem the other way, right? So what I mean by the other way is that instead of first looking at the problem from 
player 2's point of view, we could have first started to maximize the problem from player 1's perspective, then formulated a problem from player 2's point of view. That said, we could have first found the supremum over u of the expected payoff, u transpose pv, where u is entry-wise positive and the entries of u sum up to 1, you would have got a maximum over the entries of PV, where I goes from 1 till N. Let's say there's N entries in PV. We maximize with respect to player 1. Now you'd want to minimize with respect to player's 2 distribution. So minimize with respect to V this time. The maximum over PV subject to the constraints on V that are v positive entry wise and the entries of v add up to one since problem one is with respect to player one we're going to denote it by p1 and the second problem we're going to denote it by p2 okay now there's something very striking here very nice to see if we were to write the dual problem of p1 we're going to get problem p2 and likewise if we were to write the dual problem of p2 we would get p1 so actually p1 and p2 are dual problems right that's a really nice way of understanding lagrangian duality and the dual problems so for the moment let's focus on problem p1 and let's write it in a different way let's reformulate it so instead of having to deal with the maximum of the minimum of the entries of p transpose u we're going to say that P transpose U is greater than a certain vector alpha in each of its entries. So alpha repeated n times, which is the same as saying the scalar alpha times the one vector, right? So instead of having to maximize the minimum of the entries of P transpose U, we're going to maximize alpha one, which is much, you know, friendly, right? It's much easier to deal with. Or to be more specific, we're going to maximize only alpha. The scalar alpha. Now that reformulation is way easier than maximizing the minimum of the entries of P transpose U. It's an equivalent problem. So for that, we're going to formulate a problem P1 prime where we maximize a scalar alpha subject to the constraints on U, that is U positive, 1 transpose U is equal to 1, and the additional constraint that P transpose U is greater than alpha times one entry wise, right? Of course, the maximization is with respect to alpha and the vector u. Let's further reformulate and concatenate in one vector x where alpha is in its first entry and from the second to the last entry, we've got the vector u. We can rewrite p1 prime as p1 double prime where we maximize with respect to x a vector f transpose x, right, where f only selects alpha. That is, f should be 1, then all zeros, right? You can verify that f transpose x will give you alpha. Now, subject to the u positive, we're going to, since, you know, alpha will be a lower bound on a positive quantity, then alpha should also be positive. So, so alpha and u's are positive, and hence x should be positive entry wise. 1 transpose u equal to 1 will translate to ax equal to b where b is clearly 1 and a is a row matrix right that doesn't focus on alpha so 0 in its first entry and 1's in all the other entries right. And the last constraint that says p transpose u is greater than alpha times 1 could be written as, I'm going to go down here and say p transpose u minus alpha times the vector 1 is positive. And we can write this as gx greater than h, right? Where my g will contain a minus 1 column in its first column and a p transpose in the rest. So we are representing g in a block matrix form, okay? And h is clearly the all zeros vector, okay? So this problem, as you can see, is a linear program, which could be solved easily on any software. You can use Excel, Python. I'm going to use MATLAB. So I've got MATLAB open in front of me. I'm going to create a new script, call it main. 
I'm going to clear my workspace as such. Now, let's go ahead and define the P matrix, which was over here. So I'm just going to copy paste it. And now let's define the F vector, which is one then all zeros. How many zeros? Well, two zeros because player one has two moves, so two zeros. And vector or scalar in this case, which is only one. Then let's define the G, which is all ones in its first column, then a P transpose, then the H vector, which is an all zeros vector, right? And the lower bound on the problem is all zeros because we have that X should be positive. And an upper bound is a user specified parameter. So in my case, it's 100. I set it to 100. You shouldn't set it too low because what if your the optimal value of the problem exceeds your threshold. So you can tweak around this value until you arrive at the, at the solution. So let's call in prog to solve for u. We'll pass it f, g, h, a and b, and the lower bound and the upper bound. So if all is good, this should run properly. And there you see it. So this is the solution. Alpha in the first entry, then u1 and u2. If we were to look at the fractions, we get this. So 0 0.4286 is actually 1 over 2 plus a third, which means that it is 1 over 6 over 3 plus 1 over 3, which is 3 over 7. So we get that u1 is 3 over 7, whereas u2 is 4 over 7. Okay, what does that mean? It means that if we go back here to the example we have the optimal strategy of player one if he were to play the moves randomly is that he should choose move one three out of seven times and he should choose move two four out of seven times this is the optimal strategy in a sense to maximize his expected payoff right now another interesting question here is okay we know what the optimal strategy of player one is. Well, what about player two? What well, should player two not play or should he choose the moves uniformly or what? What's going on? Well, that's a nice question. And indeed, we can formulate the same problem from player two's perspective. That said, if we were to rewrite problem two using the same tricks as we did here, we're going to arrive at the following problem. So I'm going to create a main two right here and the f here would still be one and all zeros the p here is the same so 30 minus 10 20 and a minus 10 20 and minus 20 your a is zero and all ones your b is a one your g this time would be all minus one of size two and a p not a p transpose your h will be all zeros but this time of size two lower bounds and upper bounds are the same, right? And then just solve the problem using a linear program method. So run, and there you go. You get the optimal, you get the alpha, and the first entry then V1, V2, and V3. So V1 is zero, that means the optimal strategy of player two is never to play move one, and to play move two 0 0.5714 of the time, that is, four out of seven, and move three, three out of seven. All right, so now let's make this game more generic. So as you can see here in main two, we're solving for, oops, this is V, shouldn't be U. So we're solving for V only for a three-sized vector, whereas here we're, we're solving for U for only a two-sized vector. Let's generalize this for an M by N sized matrix P. Also, we're going to play the zero sum game and track each of the player's scores. So for that, let's create a new script, call it play zero sum game, right? So let's copy paste the matrix we had, although this is not necessary. And now let's extract the size of P, okay? Going back to main, I'm going to copy paste all what I had here down to here, okay? As you can see, the zeros here, I've got N zeros, whereas here I've got N ones. Right here, I've got an M-sized column containing minus ones, whereas H is of size M. Same goes for LB and MB. I'm going to solve for U and then extract 
the second to the last entries. The first entry is just the alpha, right? We don't care about it. All we care about is the distribution, okay? Now, let's go to main two and copy paste all this except the P, right? So this part solves player two strategy, namely the V vector. Whereas this part solves player one strategy, namely the U vector, okay? So over here, this time I've got M zeros and not N. Likewise, I've got M ones, I've got minus one N times, and the H's of size N, whereas LB and UB, oh sorry, over here, the LB and UB are of size N plus one, right? Whereas over here, they're of size M plus one, because F is of size M plus one. So the size of F tells us the number of variables. Now let's solve for V and extract everything except the first element. So we're going to run, and as you can see, this is V and this is U. Now, we're going to play the game. So for that, I'm going to claim two vectors, initialized by zero, that are the scores of each of the players. The score one is the score of player one, whereas score two is player two's score, right? Next, we're going to play the game, let's say a thousand times, so a thousand moves per player. And let's run a loop over here where each time we're going to append the score by a certain score, S1, for each player. Now, what is S1 and S2? S1 would turn out to be the last accumulated score plus the payoff in the matrix. Now, those payoffs are indexed using a probability distribution defined by U over here and V over here. So U over the rows and V over the columns, right? For that, we're going to need the RAND SRC. And what this guy does is generate random matrix using prescribed alphabets. So what that basically means is that generate an n size vector, so n by 1, where the values go from 1 to n, and each of the index is given a certain probability defined by u. So this guy will return the moves for player 1, so move 1. Likewise, for player 2, we're going to define moves from 1 to m, each given a probability indexed by the vector v. Okay? So the probability that, you know, I get the number 2 is in the second entry of v, right? So back down here, all I need to do is pass it move 1k and move 2k, right? So player 1 gains that much. Could be negative, could be positive. Whereas player two accumulates a negative payoff. So if player one gains, then player two loses. And vice versa. If player one loses, then player two gains. So we accumulate and in the end, we're going to open a figure, clear it out, then plot score one in blue, or going back here to the figure, Player 1 was red and player 2 was blue. So, player 1 in red and player 2 in blue, right? So let's run this. And here we see that player 1 is winning. Let's run it again and again and again. Well, let's run it 100 times. I'm going to keep running this every time. So here we see that player 1 keeps winning according to the payoff matrix that we introduced, right? Well, player two starts off winning, but he ends up losing sometimes, right? And note that this is the optimal strategy of the game. So given that each player wants to win, this is the way he should play to win. Regardless of, you know, the results at the end. If player two played another different strategy, he would lose even more. <laughs> That's what it means. This is the, let's say, the, the best play player two could lose. Now... It's not that player two is going to lose all the time. This solely depends on the, well, not solely, but well, as you can see here, player two's winning. And this will highly depend on the payoff matrix. So if I change the payoff matrix, the results are totally different. So let's say over here, I appended a row, minus 20, minus 10, and 10. And I ran multiple simulations. We can see that player one is now winning. Player one 
wins most of the time, as you can see. They start off tying, they might tie and fight for winning, but most of the time you can verify that player one would win, okay? This game could be unfair, and we're not going to go deep into game theory and what a payoff matrix might reflect, but some games are said to be unfair. Well, to give you what a fair game might look like, I'm going to give the following payoff matrix. So one minus one and minus one, one. Let's see what happens here. So we see a lot of tying. Ties, ties, pair of twos winning, pair of twos losing. Now he's winning. Now he's winning by not that much. <laughs> he's still winning. Pair of twos still winning. Lots of ties over here. You can see that there's lots of ties. Okay, good. So that's all I have to say. This is it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. In case you found it beneficial, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking the videos. If you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to ask me down below in the comment section. And I'll see you then.